the fountain I'm back when I worked at City Hall. Uh, up in Hamilton, the Patton Homestead. Um, who knew? I didn't. I, I didn't know that Jim, that uh, the family, the homestead for General George Patton Jr. and then uh, his son, uh, Major General Patton, and the family uh, had this home that was donated uh, many years ago to the town of Hamilton. And um, there are uh, also plans to. Uh, uh, make it a co-work, basically to make it a co-working space. Uh, I think there might be, there's still some kind of interpreted rooms, but the upstairs would uh, actually be kind of office space in our, you know, our post-COVID-19, uh, when, we, when we have our post-COVID uh, period again, as an organization called Inc. Dot uh, Ubate, um, that would uh, occupy the top two stories of this 1786 family home. If anyone, by the way, um, uh, I don't mind if anyone interrupts me with uh, questions or, <laughs> or comments about any of this. So it doesn't uh, just have to be me blabbing away. So, so feel free to uh, wait to. Uh, you know, share, especially if any of these, you know, you have any connections to, or, or if I need corrections or comments. Um, the old Slater Mill complex uh, in Pawtucket on the Blackstone River uh, has been owned, it's owned by an association, on, um, old Slater Mill Association, I think it is, but it's been donated to the government, the National Park Service, it's the complex, Actually, technically, I guess, have been designated as a district. So the district is now uh, being, being added to the, uh, um, the Blackstone. Um, now I'm forgetting the, the actual name of the, um, the national. Uh, uh, <laughs> Blackstone, Heritage Valley, Valley, Blackstone Valley National Heritage Corridor. It's a mouthful. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, no, I thought it had a transition, not just on the corridor, but uh, to a part of the part of the park. I, I think that's uh, that's paired with uh, Roger Williams. But anyway, um, more more good news. Uh, back in Boston, in my neighborhood here in Charlestown, the uh, the Chain Forge, uh, historic Chain Forge. There's uh, some little excerpts from some historic historic American building survey drawings. Um, Chain Forge was, was uh, significant among other things. The building was uh, first built in 1904 and then later 1904 and then some later additions. But it was uh, in the building in 1926 that two employees developed this, uh, this revolutionary type of anchor chain. You can see it on the, on the, the diagram that was much stronger than the old sort of welded uh, two links welded welded together, and it said that uh, the the from the 1926 invention, and then going into World War II, and aircraft carriers and all and, uh, and ships that were anchored in deep seas during World War II, and that it really helped helped win the war for the U.S. and the Allies. Anyhow, uh, vacant for forever. Some um, PCBs and other kind of things you might expect in an old forge, forge building that uh, also made things more complicated. But there was, uh, from, uh, for a number of years, a designation, a designated developer. Uh, and they had uh, plans uh, through, well, at least through schematics, I guess, to convert the building to a hotel. And the hotel uh, common areas would also preserve some of the chain production, production lines. Well, um, COVID uh, financing issues, especially with hotels, um, uh, didn't go anywhere. And so the new news on that is that uh, the, uh, the BPBA gave them an extension. Um, it's expensive for the developer. <laughs> it's very expensive to secure their uh, uh, designation extension, but their plan is to pursue uh, the building as a residential project rather than as a hotel. So it'd be interesting to see how that how about all, uh, especially in terms of preserving what should be preserved on the interior, uh, how that will work out. Uh, it restarts the whole 
BPDA, the whole Article 80 process. So for that big change. Uh, and this is, happens to be a South End example, but uh, that the people see on uh, Sunday, March 7th, uh, the Globe had this uh, great story about streets, streets that put people first and um, showing from Copley Wolf Design Group uh, ways to, that we have learned really through, through COVID-19 of uh, kind of taking over restaurants, uh, uh, occupying sidewalks, outdoor uh, dining. Uh, and this is showing how to really uh, capitalize on that and, and maybe make some permanent improvements that, that push back against the, uh, the car being, the, the automobile being the main, uh, the main event uh, for some of these uh, streets, especially these kind of residential streets. So great to see, you can see the parking, like the parking areas have become seating areas on, on uh, streets that are wide enough to, uh, to allow for additional lanes and obviously prioritizing pedestrians and bicyclists. Um, I always love to see stories about triple deckers and the globe. Uh, there's a story uh, also that day on March 7th, triple deckers can rise again for the 21st century. And uh, that was interesting that the, the photo in the globe of the, uh, of the house uh, in Dorchester uh, on, online uh, that uh, transformed into this uh, wonderful little graphic, but it wasn't the photo. And I wondered if there was some reason why the, the owners didn't want the house shown exactly. But uh, anyway, I thought I'd intersper intersperse that with a picture of my dad uh, on a bike uh, in, in front of one of the, one of the several tri triple deckers that the family lived in when, uh, when he was growing up. So, um, the story though, it's a great treatment, the Globe story about the, how triple deckers are a perfect candidate for a, a affordable, as an affordable housing model. Um, we're, we're all aware of the, how the flexibility, the efficiency, you know, in terms of a sustainable model with the stacked units and um, uh, opportunities probably for the solar on the roof and, and, and yards and outdoor space with the porches and so on. So, we recommend uh, you know, checking out that article if you if you want. I guess the the uh, Globe story was also uh, kind of announcing that this old house is featuring uh, for this season. A uh, the only thing is they referred to it as a gut rehab. So that was I wasn't sure about that aspect of it, but um, how much they'll be doing there. But uh, this season, uh, I believe that's but. Maybe it's that same house in Dorchester. Now I think about it. Uh, moving on, made a little more esoteric uh, uh, article uh, from, uh, from Aaron Betsky, architectural critic. Uh, I just thought it was interesting uh, the way it sort of meshes in sometimes with our uh, preservation movement, especially preserving uh, monuments of. Uh, uh, early of modernism, but uh, the article from Architect Magazine uh, asked, asked the question, is architecture having another expressive moment? Um, and that's the ways the merits of the look ma, no hands approach to design. <laughs> so uh, he kind of takes on the uh, this trend we have of uh, buildings of, that uh, are exhibiting the, either a literal or a metaphysical kind of twist on the balconies that are projecting in and out and so on, you know, just because we can, you know, can design those by computer. Uh, and it's uh, kind of uh, interesting to the article, almost acts, almost uh, represents a dialogue between some various critics who, who weighed in on this and uh, the different. Uh, uh, different opinions about it. Uh, one critic, uh, Rowan Moore, uh, referred to this type of architecture as urban clickbait, one-liner architecture. Um, you know, there's some, some that are looking at it, is it a rooted in kind of morality and aesthetics or uh, uh, asked, you know, what's wrong with the buildings? Uh, what's wrong with like, providing these twists and, and exciting, you know, exciting shapes that sets up this this uh, 
composition between the, the so-called the blob and the box. And uh, where people would say, well, these the blobs that are you know, they're way expensive, you know, like waste, of, waste of materials and all that. But the counter argument could be, well, the boxes uh, could be wasteful as well. And you know, while you're, you're trying to squeeze a particular program into, into that. But, uh, anyway, uh, I thought it was a, an interesting kind of, a, kind of treatment. And it thought, and also did, uh, the article also does show uh, the Burroughs uh, includes, um, I don't know about the irony of it or something about the Paul, Paul Rudolph's Burroughs welcome building, uh, which could be you know, his own sort of take on, on that with the sloping concrete and balconies. And, uh, and we have our Boston examples of the brutalism. That was from 1972 and it's being demolished. So uh, I guess it makes, it makes the argument kind of interesting. Um, I need to retrieve my, um, my agenda. <laughs> I'll sit on the floor, but um, this, uh, this slide is uh, just a companion to the announcement of the Biden administration um, has uh, reversed, uh, canceled the, the former administration's um, executive order that was strongly favoring classical, classical architecture. Um, and the uh, so the AIA is very very supportive of the of that uh, that position, and uh, the controversy, as most of us knew, reading the paper, had to do with the uh, and what were created out there were some of the uh, some of the rougher, I guess, examples of you know, concrete brutalism, uh, like in the lower right or the, some other poster child uh, buildings that may not have been maintained as well as they could have been. But um, I loved, as a, just to show uh, that uh, excellence in design uh, <laughs> does happen, that doesn't have to be any one you know, pigeonhole, I guess, is that Miami-Dade uh, building. At least, you know, I find it uh, very striking. So uh, the, I guess the bottom line being, uh, it's it's not it's not good to uh, say that uh, you know, quality architecture for federal buildings or in general has to be any one one style has to be classical it could be or has to be start you know, modern it could be so uh, it should be whatever is determined to be good. Uh, last uh, slide I think I have here is a story about a worldwide sand shortage, um, and the story came from CNBC. The world is running out of a crucial but underappreciated commodity. Sand is, you know, it's, it's the most consumed raw material after water, um, but the world is facing a shortage. And climate scientists say it could, <clears throat> it could be one of the greatest uh, sustainability challenges of the 21st century. Um, this picture is showing, actually there, pushing sand on to um, Miami Beach to protect, bringing sand back to the beachfront to protect um, real estate. Um, but uh, beyond, uh, you know, just sort of beyond the coastal resilience, is, uh, as the article says, our entire society is built on sand. It's the world's most consumed raw material after water, as I mentioned. But, you know, we think about all the not only you know all the, the glass, glass that's used for every window and every and computer screens and smartphones and all, but the uh, roads, bridges, trains, the uh, it, you know it's used in the construction, uh, you know, reg land regeneration projects uh, shown there. Uh, you know we think sand is everywhere and never think that we'd run out of it, but it is starting to happen in uh, in some places. Uh, and we have a big, the sand and the cement, uh, the United Nations estimates that 4.1 billion tons of cement is being produced every year, driven primarily by China, which constitutes 58% of today's sand fuel construction bill. So I guess, you know, I can say, stay, stay tuned on that. So, um, 
stop that share. Um, and last thing I didn't, uh, didn't have on, on there, but I, I did want to mention the, uh, this is a, from Historic New England, uh, the wonderful, uh, one of the benefits of membership, a wonderful magazine. And they have some, uh, some great uh, stories in, in this month, uh, including the kind of the, an overlooked history of slavery in New England. Uh, and really, I learned a lot about, about that story. Um, and they have a nice kind of a uh, travel log, uh, kind of a picture of change and continuity in continuity and, uh, and Boston's Chinatown. So it's uh, anyway, worth, uh, worth following all their, their programs uh, and activities. So with that, uh, really thrilled to, to welcome Sam Batchelor and Eric McGarland to speak about their work at the, uh, the Teaching Museum, that is the Mass Art, Art Museum. And Sam is a partner at Design Lab Architects, uh, and uh, many of us know he's been active and he probably still are in a, in a number of BSA committees and uh, I remember some some years back when we'd have our annual the annual sort of committee chairs powwows at the uh, meetings at the uh, at the BSA and sometimes I felt a little awkward just going and doing chit chat but uh, but Sam you're one I remember who he just sort of came up and we started chatting about our our work and our committees and, uh, and I appreciate that so. Uh, and Eric is a project manager at Design Lab, and uh, so we'll look forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks, Jack. Um, yeah, as, as you mentioned, we, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the Mass Art, Art Museum here. I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let's see, that should work. Can everybody see that now? Yes. All right. Um, before I get started, we do have a couple uh, guests of honor, uh, other folks who worked on the project who dropped in. We have uh, uh, Austin Ward, who uh, worked for us for um, a good bit of the project before heading back to get uh, some advanced degrees in, uh, in architecture, and uh, Jared Wasserman of Vimeo, uh, who was the construction manager for the project. So. Uh, both of you should feel free to uh, chime in with uh, any anything we either missed or uh, misrepresented on this. So, um, and I also wanted to just note and, and thank, by the way, your your office has, has generously contributed and presented to our committee before, uh, Marianne, uh, talking about your your uh, considered and thoughtful approach to stewardship and. Uh, and maybe one other time as well. So thank you again for returning. Yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, and I was actually gonna start just with a kind of brief overview. As Jack mentioned, we, we presented this, I went back and looked, it was about two years ago, Marianne and I kind of presented our core philosophy of critical stewardship um, holistically looking at a number of projects. So <clears throat> some of you may have seen that. So I'm just gonna kind of breeze through this um, quickly. Um, the idea behind critical stewardship is that it's, it's looking at the intersection of history and the environment through the lens of community. Um, so we, we chose these terms pretty specifically, uh, stewardship um, to reflect our responsibility towards all resources, um, you know, environmental, built or cultural, um, and critical, uh, meaning both essential and offering critique. Um, this is important to us because it, it kind of gives us a way to work across all typologies, whether it's new construction or renovation, rural and urban. Um, you know, it, it kind of is a, is a more broadly encompassing uh, term and philosophy that we apply to all of our projects. And so here you can see kind of the, the range of work with uh, which that applies to. Um, so the idea is that, you know, architecture is part of a world that is constantly evolving. Um, so we don't, you know, we don't have the option to sort of freeze any single architectural artifact or uh, environment in time that they must function, they must 
continue to operate. And so we like, you know, we like the metaphor of the the Brooklyn Bridge, or sorry, the Golden Gate Bridge, because you start you start painting it at one end. By the time you get to the other end, it's time to go back to the first end and keep painting. Um, so it really this reflects that we're part of a historical and environmental continuum, which we're really all a, a part of it. And so each each project that we work on um, is really just a moment in time. You know, we're not um, we're not sort of trying to restore anything back to its original piece. And we're, we're also recognizing that what we, what we create in these projects is uh, an evolving um, piece of the story and that it continues on without us and that these, these are not fixed objects when we, either when they started or when we finish with them. So it allows for interpretation um, and, and acknowledges content uh, and intent as part of the, the rubric along with material conservation, present form, all of those things which uh, we still consider as well. Um, so this allows us to make nuanced determinations based on change, research, analysis, rather than sort of dogmatic requirements or mandates. <clears throat> So with that, you know, we that that means we start each project with research. Um, so for mass art, um, we wanted to understand both the context of the school and the structure in which we are working. Um, and so both of those histories go back uh, close to or over 150 years, but don't actually intertwine until about 30 years ago in the in the 90s. Um, so Mass College of Art was founded in 1873. It's the only public art school in the country, or I guess only freestanding public art school in the country. Um, <clears throat> it has had a number of homes in Boston over the years. It started in um, Pemberton Square, now, now Government Center or near Government Center in 1873 in Least Space, and then um, was only there for about 10 years before it moved to its first purpose-built building um, in the Back Bay at Newbury and Exeter in 1886. Uh, then moved to a location at Longwood in Brookline in 1929, <clears throat> where it remained until the kind of late 80s, early 90s, um, when it moved to its present location on Huntington Ave. Um, its present location on Huntington Ave was uh, the site of the um, former Boston Girls School built in 1906. Um, and one of the things that's remarkable here in this plan is you can see its original configuration um, was a very classical facade, symmetrical, and actually um, opened up onto the emerald necklace. So um, what is now Evans Way Park connected to Huntington Avenue. Um, and you had this, this sort of very grand, beautiful facade of the, what then became the, <clears throat> the Teachers College and Girls Latin School. Um, the building on the west in this photograph is what's now called South Building. It was the Boston Normal School um, when this picture was taken um, and is where the galleries uh, have been since the um, mass art moved to this location in the 90s. Um, the flagship space in this building is this two-story um, space at the center of the building. Um, you can see it here. You can see these two arched windows here and three on the oblique side here. That is this large two-story space. Um, it served as a lecture hall, a uh, library, and uh, the museum galleries over the course of the building's history. Um, so over time, this, this building's facade was covered. Um, first by a gymnasium building that was built over the front of it as part of the Boston State College, uh, and then by the tower, as it's called in the 70s, um, uh, also part of the, I think it may have been either UMass Boston or Boston State College at that time when it was built. Um, and then <clears throat> Mass, Mass Art took over that tower when it moved in in, in the late 80s and 90s. Uh, but that's completely blocked off both the original facade of the building um, and the, um, the connection between the Emerald Necklace and Huntington Ave. 
Um, on the west side of the building, there has also been some new construction hemmed in around the building. You can see the, the or I guess this is the south south facade here. Um, it's originally, you know, was open to this lawn and the Kennedy building here was built in the 90s as a joint structure to serve um, Mass Art and the Mass College of Pharmacy. So just to kind of put all of these things in context, this is the original structure on a, on a present day axon built in 1906. Um, the, the four buildings that make it up are um, Collins on the west, um, Posen, which is the former girls Latin school on the north, um, east building in the middle, uh, which is formerly the common building, and south building, which was the former Boston Normal building. And so the Mass Art Museum um, occupied the, the south building. Um, these are the structures that have kind of since been built up and around it. Um, Kennedy building on the left in the 90s, the tower building on the 70s, um, and what is now the, the DMC, which was built in 2015, replaced the gym that was built, I think, in the 60s. At um, some point, I'd love to kind of go back and do a more detailed timeline of the, the buildings that were built around it, but that's, that's the best I can tell so far. Um, Actually, just quick, quick aside, when, when we started designing the Mass Art Museum, the DMC was under construction and they tore down the gym and exposed the sort of absolutely beautiful facade of the, the common building, um, but then ended up just covering it up again <laughs> with, the, with the DMC, uh, which was a shame. So quick, quick here above the line here are the different iterations or different institutions that have occupied the building since its construction um, uh, and below the building below the line are the different actual buildings and physical constructions uh, over time so it's it's a very sort of complicated intertwined history i won't kind of rehash all of it but it's just interesting to see um, all of the different um, edu I mean, it's always been an educational building, which is nice, but it's, it's definitely uh, changed hands and missions quite a bit. <clears throat> so getting back to the museum itself, um, when we started, it was, um, had totally lacked any street presence whatsoever. Um, and the museum is and remains uh, free and open to the public. And it is the only um, public museum on the Avenue of the Arts. It has some of the most impressive contemporary art um, in, in the city and in the country. Um, it's a tremendous resource to the community um, and people had no idea that it existed. Certainly that it was free, certainly that it was welcome. There was just a, a banner on the side of the building here um, and a small door tucked into the corner to get in where you had to go down a hallway, left down another hallway, and then left through a set of glass doors. Um, and it was, there was no reception. There was no indication that you were welcome there. You felt like you were sort of walking into a school um, that uh, you were not a student in. It was very off-putting. <clears throat> so, you know, the main principal drivers of, of the project and the renovation were first and foremost to create a new, um, new entry for the building, um, to give it a direct entrance onto Huntington Ave, to give it prominence that was equal to its peers at the MFA and, and uh, the Gardener. Um, and then in addition to that was to provide a new um, art access or art loading path to get art in and out of it instead of having to try to close down Huntington Avenue and load in the front door, which was what they did previously. Um, <clears throat> it also lacked climate control. So that was a primary goal. The building had been closed uh, all summer, every summer, because it was just too hot. There was no air conditioning. Um, and the heating system just cranked. It was a you know old steam heat. Um, you'll see later, they basically opened the windows to try to keep the building cool uh, at a reasonable temperature all winter. Um, which is not, you know, how you want to handle art. So um, they they were actually really severely limited in the types of artwork they could show. Um, and then lastly, to provide accessibility upgrades uh, to the building. There was no accessible route to the galleries on the second floor um, and really the classrooms in the building at all. Those, that's really what sort of made the project happen. 
Thanks, Sam. Um, so I'm just going to walk through some of the initial diagrams that we created for the for the project, um, and then the transformations of some of the key spaces and what they look like today. Uh, so st to start out with, uh, this was the initial initial section diagram, which helped us illustrate the general uh, organization of spaces as well as the desired flow through the building. Uh, for the first floor, we really wanted emphasis on the visual connections of the public spaces. Uh, both the gallery and the classroom back to the plaza and the street to make people better aware of the events and activities at the museum. Because as, as Sam mentioned, there was no real connection of the building at that time back to the street and to really let people know that this was a public space. Um, we also wanted the classroom to be adjacent to the front door for easy access, as well as having it directly adjacent to the gallery so that uh, the programming could take advantage of the exhibits on display. Since this was to be a teaching museum, it was important to tie back the education and exhibit, exhibit components together. Um, the adjacent back of house space uh, was the a preparatory space. Um, and it was important to have easy access to and from the gallery as well as the loading area in the back of the building. Um, and then on the second floor, uh, the sort of grand space was the pain gallery. Um, and this was a very large volume of space so we wanted to take advantage of this by creating an additional level for viewing at the overlook, um, both in terms of public viewing and the gallery staff, which uh, currently has their uh, offices located at that third floor mezzanine. And because real estate for storage was pretty limited, we were able to tuck that underneath the overlook, um, which allowed us to create larger uh, square footage of wall space um, around the perimeter of the paint gallery. Um, so just to kind of walk you through the entry sequence, uh, you come off Huntington Avenue through the updated plaza um, and into the lobby space. Uh, from there, you can access the Baccalar Gallery straight ahead, um, the gallery education room uh, to the up, uh, upper portion of the plan, and there's also a stair that leads you up to the Payne Gallery on the south side. Um, all the public access, or I should say the public accessibility if you're unable to take the stairs, there's a ele new elevator located in the upper right hand, um, and that serves both the galleries as well as the south building for the rest of the college. Um, and the back of house sort of support spaces are on the left hand side of the plan, which include the receiving and storage area where all the art is sort of unloaded into the space, uh, prepped and cleaned, and the preparatory space to the left of that uh, where all the um, display cases, walls, that kind of stuff are, are made and then delivered into the gallery spaces. Um, so Sam touched on this a little bit, but uh, for the previous conditions, there was no real path to the building. You can see that in the bottom left image here. Uh, the facade was pretty obscured by overgrown plantings and there's no real connection to Huntington Ave. Um, and to be honest, you wouldn't really know that there was public galleries there. Um, so to better create a presence of the museum, we redesigned the plaza to allow for direct access from the sidewalk to the new front door uh, and created monolithic openings on the front facade where the historic windows were. The top two windows became the primary exterior display pieces with backlit capabilities. Um, given that there's storage currently behind those two windows, um, it, it seemed justified to uh, limit the transparency back there just because there wasn't really going to be a view out anyway. Um, and the sill for the lower window was cut down to allow for the new entry door. Uh, and then the lower right window became sort of a monolithic piece of glass that offered views in and out of the classroom. Um, we, we wanted to be mindful of the historic nature of this facade in the existing openings, but at the same time, create a contemporary intervention within the facade that would reflect the happenings uh, and collections showcased within the museum. Uh, and here is just a view of the museum in the plaza at night. Um, you can see the upper backlit windows, uh, the transparency into the first floor, and the framing of the plaza really helped distinguish the museum as an active public space, uh, certainly more inviting than the previous iteration. Um, and while we took a more contemporary approach to the front facade, uh, we were a bit more conservative with the south-facing facade on the left uh, by keeping the original design of the windows. 
uh, these three arch windows are connected to the pane gallery on the opposite side. So we decided to apply a translucent white film to the inner layer of these windows to just better control the light quality and the intensity within that gallery space. So upon entry, you come into the lobby here. Uh, as previously mentioned, there was no lobby for the previous galleries. You had to enter through MassArt's South Building, walk down a couple corridors, and then enter a pair of glass doors that brought you directly into the lower gallery. There was no sort of buffer space or any indication that you were welcome or in a public space. Um, but thankfully now you enter through the new vestibule and arrive in an open lobby with immediate access to all three of the major public spaces in the building. You have the back of our gallery straight ahead through the glass doors, um, the gallery education room on the right, uh, and then the pane gallery up the stairs on the left. In this lobby, really acts as a buffer and an orientation space prior to accessing the rest of the building. Because the back of our gallery straight ahead has the most climate control requirements, um, and it's, uh, we designed it kind of as a box within a box to help control that, but the lobby also helps mitigate that temperature and humidity change uh, within the gallery by acting as that extra layer of separation between uh, the inside and outside. Um, one of the most prominent features within the lobby is the stair leading up to the pain gallery. Um, and there's an image on the bottom left here that kind of illustrates the previous stair that led up to that space. Um, but we utilized the existing opening there um, and then cut the remainder of the Bay of Terracotta vaults all the way to that back wall. Um, and this allowed us to create a straight run of stairs that really seeps down into the lobby and welcomes you and pulls you up to that space. Um, and then this is a great image that uh, shows the kind of different functions that this lobby can serve. Um, it, it can really act as like an additional program and exhibit space and the sort of modest design aesthetic allows the functionality uh, in the display within the room to be the center of attention rather than the architecture itself. Um, so the mission of the Mass Art Museum uh, is to empower the next generation of artists through education and experience. The museum has always had a great relationship with the community in Boston Public Schools. Um, it's fostered partnerships and offers a variety of engagement activities and services hosted within the museum. However, there was never a dedicated space for this. Uh, it was kind of just haphazardly done in either the Payne Gallery upstairs or the Backlog Gallery downstairs, but uh, it really interfered with any exhibits they had going on at the time. Um, so we set about to design a flexible gallery education room that could allow the museum uh, to do what it was doing, but also more and sort of in concert with the exhibitions on display rather than uh, interrupting them. Um, so we gave it direct visibility to Huntington Ave. Uh, you can see in the bottom left photo, the large window uh, we were showing you on the facade. Um, and then uh, it, it, that sort of helped spread the awareness of the public programming in the museum um, and also the adjacency that we created between the space and the back of our gallery was important for connecting students both literally and visually uh, with the professional artist and their work. Um, one of the first public events the museum hosted during the grand opening week uh, encouraged everyone to participate in the art making process and create versions of what was on display in the adjacent gallery. And again, that sort of harps on the importance of the adjacency of the classroom to the gallery, as well as its public accessibility. Uh, so the first floor back of our gallery uh, is pictured here. Um, the bottom left two photos show sort of the original uh, configuration of that space or conditions of that space. Um, it was a little limited because it had a full height partition wall that divided the space um, and it lacked any sort of climate control besides the occasional opening and closing of windows, which as Sam mentioned was not really suitable for most professional artwork and limited what they could display as well as the timing of these displays. Um, and so the new layout uh, that we designed for the back of our gallery is just a large open floor plan um, with walls and ceilings that are backed with uh, three quarter inch plywood to provide a stronger substrate to mount larger pieces of artwork to. Again, the existing conditions of that space limited the pieces that they could showcase. Um, then here you can see that the 
the finished space is just a flexible white box with upgraded lighting, power, climate control. Um, another great feature that we included are recessed anchors that are located throughout the space, both in the floor and the ceiling, um, which provide the museum the capability to fasten temporary partitions to without having to drill and then fill in those holes every time they switch out exhibits. Peter, um, could you talk about those great columns? Was it, dip, was it complicated to leave them exposed? Uh, it, it surprisingly wasn't. Um, that was, we knew that they existed because of old drawings, but um, at the time, none of them had been exposed before. Um, and there was terracotta that was infilled sort of haphazardly uh, within these columns. And so I guess the, the only difficulty was making sure that we could remove that without damaging the existing lattice work of the columns. Um, but yeah, it really adds a great feature and helps balance the old and the new within the space and the lobby. One thing that's interesting, you can see the three lattice columns in this space are original columns. The circular column in the foreground was actually part of a renovation at some point, I, I don't know when, where they, they put a new mezzanine in that, um, that upper space where the um, offices are now. Um, that mezzanine was, um, um, at a weird sort of half floor level. So we had to put in new structure on top of it to kind of lift it up the extra, whatever it was, six or eight feet um, to get it to the third floor. But the structure that supported it went went all the way through down into the basement onto a new set of foundations in the basement. So that, that circular column, there's another one um, buried in the wall off to the left um, is part of a sort of weird insertion of another story uh, at some point in the building's history. And here's another great photo that kind of shows the intricacies of those lattice columns. Um, and then also the visibility connection from the galleries back to the education room and lobby, as well as extending that view corridor all the way to Huntington Avenue. Um, and this is just a great example of how the space can adapt to changing exhibits. Um, it can start out as this pure white box, but then be painted black and uh, be configured to whatever the artists need to do within that space. Like hang umbrellas from the ceiling. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so moving on up to the second floor, um, the primary space here is the pain gallery. And so that is accessed through the stair on the bottom of the plan. Um, and then accessibility access can be achieved through the elevator in the upper right. Um, we also have gallery staging and prep space. Uh, located in the upper left hand, and then adjacent to that is the staff break room uh, and new conference room. Um, so again, the premier space is this upper gallery, the pain gallery. Um, the previous space had no climate control, again, except with operable windows, similar to the back of our gallery. Um, although there were a handful of panes of glass that were either missing or cracked. So even this form of climate control was fairly limited. Um, they had a, a bunch of low partitions that framed the perimeter of the space, uh, which given the large volume of the paint gallery really limited the scale of artwork that could be mounted. Um, there was also just some general deficiencies in the lighting and power of the space similar to uh, the back of our gallery below. So during the design process, the client advocated for another white box, uh, similar to the downstairs approach. However, there were more historical remnants within this space that we felt we could uncover, preserve, and highlight uh, in concert with the white box aesthetic. Um, some of these features included the uh, three large arched windows as seen in the upper image, um, along with the surrounding plaster and ornate trim on that wall. Um, there's steel trusses and terracotta vaults that were uh, buried beneath the um, plaster ceiling, uh, as well as some really nice brick texture around the perimeter of the space that were buried behind the plaster walls. Um, so all of that we were looking to uncover um, and highlight to give the space a bit more character than just uh, a white box. Um, and so, uh, this is just a great time-lapse video that we took starting from the beginning of construction all the way through. 
Um, and you can see the drastic change in the perceived scale of the space uh, just by removing the plaster ceiling to expose the vaulted ceiling and trusses above. Um, also, by removing the plaster walls to expose the brick on either side of the south wall, uh, we highlighted the remainder of the plaster in that trim, as well as the historical windows. The new windows are steel framed, but they match the same proportion and original design as the previous wood windows. And once all the finishes and paint were installed, uh, you can really appreciate the contemporary white box aesthetic, but again, with that added character and texture from the historical remnants of the space. Um, and so this is uh, the final product that we were left with. Um, you can see the emphasis placed on that south facade by kind of aligning the perimeter walls with that uh, and really framing this historical remnant. Um, and the light and detailed stair and railing that kind of bisect that window um, are uh, at least of the same language as the windows. Um, and while they are a key design feature, they don't really distract from the historical elevation or the rest of the space. They kind of just blend together and doesn't call too much attention to itself. Um, another key design feature in the space was the blackout shades. Um, and we were able to kind of recess those and mount them within the dental molding along that top cornice piece to kind of, again, hide them and not draw too much attention to them. Um, but the challenge those posed were that we had to offset the stair about an inch off from the wall so that they could slide past um, and then completely black out the windows. Uh, and here's just another overall view of the space. Um, the stair leads up to that overlook, uh, which then leads into the offices on the left-hand side. Uh, and just a note here, uh, the two arched windows on that back wall are infilled um, and are frames with a white steel surround. Uh, to sort of mimic the approach to the exterior facade uh, where we have those steel surrounds um, and that backlit uh, kind of display piece. So this is the back side of that front facade. Uh, and then here uh, is a look from the gallery overlook down to the main gallery. Uh, and then you have the gallery offices to the right here. Um, and then the old windows, again, you can see on the back wall here, had previously been covered from behind with the addition of the Kennedy building um, about, when, I forget the exact date, but uh, even though there was the CMU wall back there, code still required us to infill that with fire separation. Um, so we had to take the windows out, but we decided to kind of approach it in a similar manner as the wall you saw in the previous image where we infilled that space, uh, created a steel surround to sort of emphasize the fact that those windows uh, or that condition did exist in the past. Um, and I think the contrast of having the, the clean new jip with the steel surround against the texture of the brick really make those uh, elements pop within the space. Uh, and this is a, a great image of the result uh, that we have with the ceiling condition. Before it was just a flat plaster ceiling. Um, you would have no indication that there was at least six feet beyond that, uh, which included the vaulted uh, terracotta ceiling, all the steel work. Um, and so we utilized those steel trusses to help suspend uh, both the track lighting fixtures, um, as well as uh, install these anchoring points or loops at each intersection of the trusses so that this, the space could really adapt to whatever the artist wanted to do there, um, especially suspend, suspend work. Uh, and then finally, you come up the stairs that we previously mentioned up onto the gallery overlook, uh, and then that leads you in directly into the gallery offices there. Um, where previously the offices had been kind of small room on the first floor, tucked away uh, without any real connection to the galleries, we really wanted them to have this prominent space where they could uh, be fully immersed in the artwork that they were curating. Um, and so here, as mentioned, the original space uh, in the left two images were pretty small um, and lacked any sort of character and especially storage space. Um, they didn't have any adjacency to the gallery spaces uh, and also lacked collaboration space needed to kind of make these uh, the, the exhibits sort of come to life. 
Um, and so the challenge with placing them here was that uh, there was an existing mezzanine, uh, as Sam mentioned with that column that buries down into the Bacalar Gallery. Uh, these are the columns, uh, the gray ones um, here that existed and supported the old mezzanine, but we needed to raise them up about six feet to align with the third floor of the South Building um, so that we could utilize the circulation kind of egress there. Um, so this was important uh, where we demolished the old mezzanine reconstructed it at a higher level. Um, and so you can go to the next one. So here you can see sort of the result of that. Um, and the great piece about this is now the windows sort of become an eye level piece. Um, and so we looked to preserve those, but the challenge was that there were certainly privacy concerns, this being an office space. And then on the opposite side was just a public corridor for students to go to and from classes. Um, so we wanted to treat them in a similar way that we did the uh, exterior windows on the opposite wall, where we uh, put a translucent um, white film in between the layers uh, and then painted the windows to kind of match the opposite wall. The other great feature that we uncovered were these larger lattice columns. Um, and so we removed the encasement surrounding those uh, and they really help add kind of rhythm to the space uh, and kind of a grid pattern so that Later on, it helped us define the furniture layouts uh, as well as align lighting and other systems too. And here you can see a result of some of those decisions. Uh, the painted windows pretty well reflect the condition on the south elevation on the opposite wall. And so it really helps tie that whole volume of space together. So when you're up here, you can kind of look across and see a mirror image of what you're seeing behind you. Um, and these windows can also be seen from that back corner underneath that facade as well. Um, and so uh, the other great thing was we offset the ceiling uh, in the walls from the columns to help them pop a little bit. So sorry, if you go back one image and kind of see how the columns are highlighted by pushing the ceiling off the wall a bit. And then the back wall uh, is off those columns as well about an inch. So you get that nice shadow line there. Um, and throughout the whole project, we try to use uh, a fairly muted palette with the materiality uh, and color um, to really let the furnishings, uh, art and activities uh, do the talking within the space. And that same thought process applied to the space as well. Uh, and then this is just a great image of the relationship that offices have to that gallery space where they're literally fully immersed um, in that in, in that exhibit um, and have a great view and vantage point of all the happenings down within there. <laughs> so, um, yeah, ultimately, despite, you know, our efforts to focus on preserving and exposing different elements of the original structure, the new space is really designed as a as a white box. So um, it, it allows the architecture to recede and the artwork to take over the space. Um, this is the initial installation in the pain gallery. It uh, takes up a 50 by 50 by 30 foot uh, volume of space. Um, and it's hung from the ceiling, um, which had, um, had sort of strong points welded to it so that they had, they, they had these points where they could anchor to, directly to the ceiling. Um, and the director, Lisa Tung, commissioned the piece to take advantage of this space. So um, to do something that couldn't be done in any other gallery, which was have this sort of massive immersive installation um, and yet nothing touched any of the walls or floor of the gallery. Um, and ultimately, you know, we really see this as the, the true success of the project, right? To enable art that's unique to the space um, and to the mission of the school. Um, while supporting it in a way that brings um, art education to, to the forefront. Um, so that's all we have. Well, I think we ran a little long and I think we were supposed to end at nine, but we're happy to stick around and take questions as needed. Thank you very much. No, not a problem at all on, on, the, on the time. So uh, I love it. <laughs> that's great. I love the... Uh, the great spaces, the white boxes, the muted, the palette, the built-ins are, are just wonderful in the glazed areas. But my, <clears throat> one question I had was uh, in the floor plans, they showed 
these sort of zones of like two feet wide along the corridors. And I wondered were those originally in the school lockers or and or were those part of a original ventilation system? And in any case, how are those, were those repurposed for something? Um, yeah, when we pull up a four plane, you mean um, like the on both floors, but the downstairs, yeah, yeah so those, yeah, here, yeah, were those lockers? No, those that was the original ventilation system, it had a oh. had an original gravity ventilation system, which had been then repurposed for other things. And, and when we did the renovation, we actually used it for most of our vertical circulation, uh, for, for duct work and things like that. Um, it, it, it also was a little bit of surprise when we finally got it open. There was a lot of wiring and piping that, um, you know, by code, we were sort of technically allowed to reuse, but the inspector looked at it and said, there's, there's no way you're closing those walls back up with that in the condition that it's in. So we had to essentially re repipe and rewire the entire building as part of the project. Anyone else with questions? I had a question about the uh, the fire rating or the uh, the terracotta infill you mentioned there mm -hmm. uh, on those neat lattice columns. So was that that wasn't structural or fireproofing, or you had a different fire rating of the new building or something like that? I think no. it was a, it was originally fireproofing, but um, you know we were able to classify the building so that the um, the steel did not need to be rated. Um, so we were able to remove that. That's fine, yeah. That's great. There's a wood shop in that school somewhere, right? I know Mitch Ryerson and myself. Yes, seen yeah. Some of those great shows of the, that created a new table for the Forestry Association out at Harvard. And I saw that exhibit, it's great. Yeah, the new wood shop is, um, I think it's in the DMC. It was in the basement of uh, mm -hmm. um, the East Building for a long time, but I think it's now in, in the DMC. In the basement of the DMC, yeah. Yeah. Great, good job. Can I, I ask? Heard of... Go ahead. Oh, can I ask a, a question? Just given that the space is, that, like the, the upstairs gallery space had been at, unconditioned uh, and now it is I was just curious about your approach towards insulation and um, you know we all have discussions about masonry walls that don't have conditioning and then do and maintaining the integrity of the walls and, and such and I, I know it's a big topic but do you have a, a short story of how you handled that yeah. issue yeah, so essentially we did not insulate the walls um, for that very reason, that we didn't want to jeopardize the masonry. Um, it did mean that the pain gallery um, had a kind of wider range of acceptable climate control space. Um, so the back R gallery on the first floor um, has, a, has a higher humidity at point. Um, so if they want to do works on paper or anything like that. It has to be down in the in the back of our gallery. Um, and that was, as Eric mentioned, set up as a box within a box. So that gallery has no exterior walls. Um, so that's why the lobby and the classroom and the stair all kind of serve as a buffer for that space. Um, and then the um, pain gallery up above, one of the other reasons we wanted to expose the masonry both inside and out, obviously out, but keep you know re-expose it on the inside is just to allow it to breathe a little more. Um, but we were we were able to actually significantly improve the energy performance of the building just with the the improvement in the systems, and we replaced the roof and um, did a lot of added a lot of insulation on the roof, which um, obviously is where you lose most most of your heat. And because the building had been kind of hemmed in on three sides by new buildings. Um, there actually weren't that many true exterior walls anymore. Thank you. Hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the existing condition process. Were you, did you use state of the art kind of like a camera uh, geoscope equipment or was it an old fashioned uh, tape measure? 
And if you could just tell me that part of the process, because renovation is such a challenge for existing conditions. Thank you. Um, yeah, we did just do tape measure. Mo actually, mostly we're just relied on uh, original drawings and, and some of the renovation drawings that we had um, and, and verified stuff with the tape measure. We do, um, you know, it's interesting. It's you know, only been five years, but in the intervening five years, we've started to rely a lot more on scanning. Um, but at the time, we weren't. What um, has this had any impact on visitation, or have you have any information on that? Since that was a goal, um, it it has. We think, uh, unfortunately, COVID had a bigger impact on visitation. Um, so they they opened, I think, like two weeks before the lockdown. Um, so they had they had a fantastic opening. Tons of people came. It was wonderful, and then they shut it down. I had read about, I'd read about the uh, terracotta, the vaulting, and as a as a Guastavino fan, I was starting to get excited and wondered about that. It looked like from your photographs, though, that the vaulting it's it's from kind of steel to steel and. Is it that, that this big thick kind of fire block waffle type uh, like like the picture showed on the walls? Yeah, pretty much. It's not uh, it's not Guastavino level vaulting uh, for sure. But um, in fact, when we exposed it, there were a lot of people who weren't sure if we should leave it that way. They thought it looked gross, and we couldn't po ever yeah. possibly do that. But you know, you, you get a good coat of white paint on it, and it all kind of homogenizes a bit more. Yeah. I suppose I suppose those air those channels in between the blocks provide some level of insulation. Yeah. Any others? Yeah, that's a great job. Yeah. So this is all it's all terracotta on the ceiling. You can see the walls here are are actually brick. Um. So that's the exposed brick, and this is the. Um, the terracotta block, but you can see it's all it's all mortared together, and the mortar kind of oozes out and around the joints a bit. It's it's pretty rough. It was never really m intended to be exposed, but like I said, mm -hmm. get, a, get a bit of white paint on it, and it cleans up. Nice. And I assume it's like a flat arch that on the in cross section, the top is actually flat and leveled, and then the width they're kind of keystone. Exactly. Yep. Any, any other questions, comments? Great. Well, it's, again, this is really wonderful. Thank you again for presenting and now knowing that it's open to the public, uh, I look forward to visiting. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for having us. And yeah, hopefully, yeah, it. Uh, hopefully it gets, uh, gets the green light to open soon and um, you know, a lot, a lot of the other museums in town have been able to open in COVID, but because it's a uh, state institution and the whole college is closed, they haven't been open at all. But so hopefully, hopefully that'll change. Um, sounds like this fall, they'll be able to op be open. And I think both of the original exhibits um, will still be installed. They haven't swapped them out yet because they, they were only open for a couple of weeks. So you should be able to see both of them. Hmm. Very good. All right. Well, thanks well, very thank much. Yeah. Uh, well, we have uh, from the, the agenda, hopefully people received it or, or got it in, from the chat earlier, but a number of announcements I've listed for coming events. That for, by the way, that Mass Historical Commission, their MPPF program deadline, it's coming right up soon on the 19th. Uh, Preservation Alliance, Boston Preservation Alliance. So they've got the annual meeting on the 25th. And then also uh, nominations uh, are open for uh, their uh, Preservation Achievement Award uh, program and ceremony. Uh, architectural plastics and polymer composites. Uh, I see Susan Schur is on and she can jump in if she wants to share anything more about that. But the, the uh, transformed uh, version of uh, what uh, used to be in a face-to-face -face conference. And for this year will be a conference, a unique conference proceedings plus package that will be available 
later in the month. Uh, and then I also got from uh, Sarah Mar Mar Marscom, uh, the they will do, uh, she's uh, organizing another dismantle preservation uh, conference. So um, that will be returning in July and they're, uh, they're uh, seeking um, uh, anyone wants to submit um, uh, abstracts for, for papers. So other than that, we uh, uh, the one thing I did want to share uh, again, uh, I mentioned last time, the, um, the BSA is instituting a, uh, or they kind of rolled out last month, a, uh, a new policy about a, a charge, it would be a small charge for our programs where we offer CE credit. And I, I'm, I've been wondering and would love to get input as to whether if, uh, you know, we, that's for the, for the longest time, our, like in Mass uh, Art Museum, uh, our programs have been free and open to the public. This introduces, a, I guess it's a $10 charge. So on one hand, it's you know, probably less than a fitness or yoga class or something. But on the other hand, it would mean that people who don't even need the CE credit um, <coughs> um, who are have been you know have been sort of following the committee but are not otherwise officially affiliated with the BSA either as a professional or in, you know one of the other categories uh, would then have to pay in order to participate. So I anticipate that you know moving forward, some not all of our some, but not all of our programs will, you know, we, we want to uh, offer the CE credits as we have. But um, please provide, you know, if you have any thoughts, concerns, complaints, uh, you know, share those with me or directly with the DSA, uh, how this change will, uh, might uh, sort of play out really, because uh, I wouldn't want people to stay away because of that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, it's also great that when we do, as we often do, have have programs that are uh, are part of part of the lifelong you know, sort of professional education, and sometimes are related to the HSW. So, uh, thanks, Eric. You got to go. But, uh, so, um, feel free to share any of that. Other than that. Um, April 8th, we've got uh, city archaeologist Joe Bagley uh, coming back, and uh, among other things, I think we'll be talking about, or primarily talking about his recent, actually, I don't know if it's out yet, but uh, his new book, Boston's Oldest Buildings and Where to Find Them. Uh, in terms of announcements, uh, does anyone have anything to share that uh, I might have missed or uh, should, be, should be shared about upcoming events, programs? Okay, everyone's happy. All right, very good. So, let's see you guys. See you guys next time. Okay, thank you, Jack. Thank you, Thanks Jack. Lot, Jack. Thank, thank you, Jack. Jack. Very much. Thanks all. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Interesting Great show.